The bloodshed in this region floods Canada with fear and grief. My Facebook feed is filled with dead people, missing people. Are they okay? Is my uncle okay? Is my aunt okay? The emotional toll, at times unbearable. My brother is there right now. It's very scary. I cry a lot at night. Desperate for news while dreading the worst. Here's Ellen Morrow to break down how one woman with loved ones in Gaza copes with non-stop anxiety. Hello. For Reem Sultan, calls like this are everything. Connecting her, however briefly, to her loved ones in Gaza. How are you feeling after that call and hearing everything he told you? Distraught, very distraught. It's difficult, difficult to fathom what they're going through, to know that you're so far away and that you can't help. When you don't get through, when you call, and you get no answer, what's that like? You just think they're gone. That's what you think. Every bad scenario goes through your mind. Israel insists it's targeting Hamas, the militant group in control of Gaza, after the atrocities of last weekend. But in a place so crowded and with no way out, it's civilians who often pay the highest price. What about my family, my aunts and uncles and cousins that have nothing to do with what's happening and yet are at the risk of, of dying at any moment? It really, really hurts. My cousin tells me there's no more bread in the bakeries for them to eat. There's no electricity. The internet is very weak or non-existent. Nothing will come in, no food, no medicine, no um, water. And the worst part is you cannot do anything. This is us sitting in the house, just uh, drinking tea in an evening. This is my aunt, my cousins, and then other members of our family. Reem visited her relatives in Gaza just last year a family scarred by war. This is Leanne. She is so precious. Leanne's grandfather, Reem's uncle, she says, was killed in an airstrike in a previous wave of violence between Israel and Hamas. Reem fears what could happen next. Just looking at the picture going, will this be there when I go? Will this that my grandfather put on the floor be there when I come back? Um, would the walls be there? Would this tree that I grew up smelling the jasmine on be there? These, this, that's what goes through your mind. When you think about the next few days, speculation about a possible ground invasion, how do you deal with that? I don't think about it. I refuse to think about it. I can't take any more. <laughs> When she's not at work, Reem is glued to the news, and sleep can be impossible. Even when I do sleep, I'm constantly waking up and checking my phone. Constantly waking up and checking my phone. It's very difficult. Every human being deserves a chance to live, live in peace. Do you really see a future where there is a lasting peace? I do have that hope. Because... At the end of the day, humans want peace. Israelis want peace. Palestinians want peace. I have that, I, I have that certain certainty in my heart. That's what Reem has prayed for every day, and never more so than right now. Ellen, what's your sense of what Reem wants to see happen next? 
Well, as much as Reem has that hope for peace, you heard there, Adrian saying Israelis want peace, Palestinians want peace. She also said that as casualties grow on both sides, this vicious cycle, as she called it, will continue. What she hopes for in the midst of it is that there can be some way for civilians to be able to actually get out of Gaza, for more medical supplies to be able to get in. Uh, there's talks underway involving the U.S. trying to make something like that possible through Egypt. So for now, for Reem, like for so many, it's an anxious waiting game to see what happens next and hoping that through it all, her family remains safe. Ella Morrow, thank you. You're welcome. Getting access inside Gaza is very difficult right now, but earlier today, CBC News was able to reach an internal medicine physician in Gaza on his phone. Dr. Haman Allo talked about what life has been like the past five days. Um, it's like uh, one minute you're sitting with your children, playing with them, embracing them, trying to make things easier for them, and the next minute you're sweeping away a broken glass and trying to save them from being injured by the products of explosion. Another minute going to hospital, seeing patients deprived because of the shortages and medications, utilities, surgeons, blood products, it's a mess everywhere. Thinking while working what to do with the clean water supply, what to do with electricity, how are you going to have your phone charged, how would you make it to work and the way back home, thinking what's going to happen the day next, the day after, the week next, thinking about your patients who are, I'm sorry, thinking about your patients who are afraid not to get their medication, especially those with chronic serious illnesses like patients with solid organ transplants. They don't get their supply of medications. They're afraid of losing their organs. Dr. Allo said one big challenge is keeping children occupied so they don't focus on the chaos and destruction. He should know his three children are age five, four, and four months. Family is family no matter where. And last night, hundreds of Jewish families gathered in London, Ontario. Nick Purden was there to witness a vigil for the dead and prayers for the living. Jewish survival depends on us all coming together. If I were there, I could be doing something. It could be feeding people, I could be helping package bandages, wh whatever. The Israel-Hamas war is happening on the other side of the world, but for the people here tonight, it's very close to home. I can't tell you how much it means to see this kind of support after what has been an absolutely devastating weekend. The main goal of tonight was really to, to get the community together so that we can support each other, so that we can collectively find uh, some resilience uh, and hopefully uh, spark a little hope. Yes, there will be dark days ahead, but we will get through this as we always do. The needs are great, but we will rise to this challenge. It's standing room only at the Jewish Community Centre in London, Ontario. People tell me they're here because they can't stop thinking about what's happening in Israel. Terrible, horrible. We cannot focus. We haven't turned off the TV for the last four days. We're not sleeping. We're not eating. Like, it's, it's close to home. And to think of the, the kids and babies and mothers that were just taken or murdered, or, it's just horrible. When we hear of the atrocities that these demonic enemies of ours that are subhuman did to innocent children, babies, teenagers, we never expected this, nor would we ever. But we're not helpless. You know, how would you say that the war is affecting your life? I, I just feel deep grief for the people who are dying in Israel, in Palestine, in my brother is there right now. He refuses to leave. He is uh, there to defend Israel, and he's waiting to be called up from the reserves. What's that like to know your brother is there? It's very scary, but um, it fills us with so much pride to know that he's there defending all of us. Talia came here with her grandmother, Beryl, and she tells me she got some bad news this weekend. 
part of the family was in the kibbutz Be'eri that was overrun on Saturday and people murdered and in fact they told us they're probably going to raise it. There's, there's nothing left. I'm just pausing because that's, that's a heavy thing to hear. It's a very heavy thing. What, tell me about the, what comes with that for you. What comes with that is considerable pain right here. Please rise as I recite a special prayer for the safe return of all those kidnapped during the terror attack. I meet Michelle, and she tells me this isn't the first time her family has faced a war. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor, and my husband's grandmother was also a Holocaust survivor. She called me today, and she said, how is my family, how are my grandchildren, are they alive? And I said, Bobby, they're alive now, and I hope they're going to stay alive, but they're fighting for their country. We're still mourning. We're still in shock. My brothers are serving on the front lines right now. And my friends, all, every, my Facebook feed is filled with dead people, missing people. All of my friends from high school have been called up to reserve duties. Everyone is serving. Every Jew is feeling pain right now. Every Israeli is feeling pain right now. Hope is our people, Hatikva. It's our national anthem, it's what we stand for. We have hope, we have to have hope. So just a thought in listening to people opening up, both in Nick's piece and in the tired voice of that Palestinian doctor in Gaza. Every day here, we see people going out of their way to speak out. It's the worst moment of their lives. You'd imagine they wouldn't want anything to do with journalists, and some don't, of course. But there is an overwhelming feeling that people see talking as a duty, uh, a duty to bear witness. We see them seeking out journalists, talking in, in brutal detail, but saying people cannot look away from this. And even when, even when you're speaking with someone and they break down and you make it clear that they don't have to keep talking, we've seen people sort of bear down and say, no, I do, I have to. This, this is a, a wrenching but sort of really important detail about what's happening here, and they may need that resolve for a while because the more the details emerge of what's happened, the more this escalates, the worse it will get. So David, if we can bring you back in here for a moment, uh, we should talk about the next steps here militarily. Absolutely, and I've been keeping an eye on the growing reliance on Israel's Iron Dome, how precisely it works to knock rockets out of the sky. But Israel's military moves need to take into account the hostages held in Gaza. Adrian, you've got the developments there. Yeah, I can tell you a few things are important to watch. When the U.S. Secretary of State, David, arrives tomorrow, he'll be bringing in an official who works as a hostage envoy. So he will be working on behalf of Americans. Then there will be a meeting far from here tomorrow. The Qatari ruler and the German Chancellor are talking. So it's, it's not necessarily anything unusual. It's an economic meeting largely, but Qatar has been involved around the world in hostage negotiations in the past, and there are families really hoping there's somehow a way to make a deal happen. Negotiations are not what Israeli authorities are talking about, not what Hamas is talking about, but that doesn't mean efforts won't be made in the background. Some commentators here are pushing for the hostages to be on the agenda of that meeting tomorrow. All right, Adrian. Well, we'll leave it there for now and say goodnight to you. But, of course, you'll be back tomorrow with more from Jerusalem. Stay safe in the meantime. You bet. Next up, that Iron Dome I mentioned, stopping rockets from landing on Israel. But is it foolproof? We explain how it works next. When rockets are launched from Gaza to hit Israeli targets, Israelis depend on a system called the Iron Dome, counter missiles that detonate the threat in midair. For the better part of a week, its effectiveness has been put to the test like never before. Let's break down how this sophisticated protection actually works. 
Hamas's surprise assault began with the firing of thousands of rockets from Gaza deep into Israel. Many landed, causing damage and death. But the majority were stopped by this, Israel's Iron Dome interceptor system, operational since 2011. Developed with the United States, but only used operationally in Israel, the system is mounted on trucks to be moved where needed, but also to avoid being targeted itself. It's composed of three subsystems, a radar to find inbound rockets and determine where they're headed, a battle management computer, and a launcher with 20 missiles used to intercept threats up to 70 kilometers away, then explode next to them and kill that threat. The system can and does track hundreds of rockets or missiles at once, considered perhaps the best ever system at doing so. But it isn't infallible. Swarms of rockets can overwhelm it, likely why Hamas fired 4,500 rockets in just three days. Some did get through. One significant factor is cost. Hamas rockets can be just a few thousand dollars, while each interception can run between forty dollars and $100,000. But Israel's not going to run out of interceptors. The Americans make the Tamer missile and have vowed to now resupply Israel's already sizable stocks. To conserve missiles, the Iron Dome will only intercept if it determines the threat will hit a populated center. Otherwise, the sophisticated system ignores it. For more than a decade, the Iron Dome has provided security and solace to many Israelis. That's now been shattered, not solely by Hamas's rockets, but the murderous ground assault which followed. A final note on that for now. The Iron Dome system became operational in March of 2011, and the very next month, it performed its first interception of a Grad rocket, one fired from the Gaza Strip at the Israeli city of Ashkelon. Well, that is it for our war coverage tonight, but here's a quick peek at another story we'll bring you in the coming days. Anya Zolajowski breaks down why 2023 is the year of the strike. We're here at this strike in Toronto. It's one of many that have taken place across the country. And we want to find out why so many workers are walking off the job. Daniel Rodriguez has worked at Metro for 20 years. I'm just working all the time and I'm, it's, it's hard, right? Like, I break down, it's, I cry, like it's, it's, it's so tough. He's one of nearly 4,000 Metro workers who decided to pick it, shocking their employer and even their union. And they're not the only ones demanding more money, all while some employers are reporting record profits since the pandemic. Coming up next, a couple of filmmakers looking for muscles found something entirely unexpected. Out of the murk looms this, this really large, large shape. The century-old shipwreck in our moment. What you're looking at might be the answer to a mystery unsolved for more than a century. A ship that sank and vanished to the bottom of Lake Huron was never seen again until now. And it happened by chance after two Ontario filmmakers on a mission to find mussels stumbled on the shipwreck instead. Their deep water discovery is our moment. Oh my goodness, it's a shipwreck. We live on the shores of Lake Huron, and there's been a, a massive change that's gone on. There are quadrillions of invasive mussels basically covering the bottom of all the lakes except for Lake Superior. That's really why we wanted to embark on this mission, to, to get down there and play James Cameron, to show people this massive change. We received a tip, so we thought, ah, oh, well, well, we'll have a quick look. Out of the murk looms this really large, large shape, and we could see 
it's a pretty big ship. So we're, we're all pretty pumped about it at that point. So we reached out to some of the local historians. A ship called the Africa really sort of bubbled to the top of what this vessel might be. It went down in 1895 in an early season snowstorm. We actually live in Larsen Cove and Larsen Cove is named after Hans Larsen, the captain who went down on the Africa. And so we're like, what? That's crazy. So, you know, to have that personal connection is almost like fate or something. Uh, absolutely amazing. They call it a shipwreck, but it's not wrecked at all. It's just that intact ship. Uh, part of the reason we can see it so well is those invasive mussels. Not great for the ecosystem, but very good at filtering the water. That's why it is so clear. Well, that is the National for Night. Thanks very much for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm David Common. Have a great night.